This video is sponsored by me. Yeah, how often do you hear that? For the month of September, I'm going to be streaming the JRPG September Marathon. Starting from the 7th, I'll be streaming almost every single day for over 6 hours tackling the likes of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and Dragon Quest XI. So come join us as I buckle down on some amazing single player experiences. I'm also upgrading my entire stream setup compared to what you're probably seeing right now, so come see the improvements. I'm making a whole bunch of upgrades and I just kinda like doing it, and it's just a whole lot of fun. Do you know this exists? I didn't know this existed until very recently when I found a giant advert for this film on the side of an Edinburgh bus. I mean, I guess it makes sense. The Lego Movie was an outstandishly fresh movie idea with some witty humour, crazy story and greatly detailed animation, even frame by frame. So of course it only comes naturally that Lego's unwanted cousin will try and take a piece of the pie too, I guess. The Playmobil Movie. A friend of mine told me that this film was commissioned about three weeks after the Lego movie came out, and I'm not even gonna fact check it, because it sounds about right. This movie is blatantly and shamelessly trying to recapture the magic that the original Lego movie had, although it reached the big screens a whopping five years late. The Playmobil movie has had a rocky production period to say the least, with it originally planning to come out two years ago in 2017. And thanks to companies going bankrupt, the US distribution rights are also problematic. So if you're in the US, you get to wait until all the way into December before you get the glorious eyesore hitting your screens. But don't worry, I'm here for you. I came to watch this film so that you don't have to. Yes, you're welcome, and I know, I am part of the problem for buying tickets to this unearned cash grab. But hey, money I spent is money you don't have to. So let's actually delve into this film a little bit, shall we? The premise of the movie is that our protagonists, soon to be orphans Marla and Charlie, are sucked into the Playmobil world and must take on adventures to reunite, escape and fix their relationship after the death of their parents four years ago. Already it sounds bare bonesly interesting enough of an idea, if not just sounding like yet another generic isekai anime of this decade, but what splits it apart from all the rest is its creative use of absolutely nothing. Nothing about this film is wholly original, and it genuinely feels like you're being bashed around the head with an Argos catalogue. Thank you to whoever wrote that amazing description. This film was very much written by people who wanted to make another Lego movie, but had no conceptual idea of what made the Lego movie genuinely good. Part of what made the Lego movie good was the way that it encapsulated that Lego-y world and feel without looking like one giant product placement. A simple one to go by, the animation of these two films. Both are fully CGI'd, but the Lego movie goes above and beyond with its presentation by making every single frame look like it could have realistically been made through Lego stop motion. Headpieces disappear and reappear, and even when showing off the ocean, it's not made of water, it's made of blue Lego bricks to represent water. Meanwhile, once the Playmobil movie goes into the Playmobil world, everything's just animated. That's about it, really. The water looks like water. The characters look like Playmobil characters, sure, but everything else just looks normal. And maybe that's just because the Playmobil set designs do just look like basic and plastic and uninteresting. But even if everything looked more plastic and fake, it could have been at least a little bit more interesting. Because after a while, even the characters stop looking like Playmobil characters and just look like a new style of another generic kid-friendly animated movie. It just becomes normal looking. All the visual charm of the Lego movie is entirely lost in the Playmobil movie. But let's stop getting ahead of ourselves and start at the very beginning. The Playmobil movie very much likes to take its inspiration from the Lego movie by also showing off a hybrid genre of live action along with animation. Though instead of starting out in the toy world and expanding out into the real world like the Lego movie does, the Playmobil movie chooses to start from real life and dive in later. And this whole set design for the live action segments, for some reason just feel like it's been plucked right out of a Disney Channel film. It all just looks so plucky and fake. Anyway, it's here we meet Marla and Charlie, some happy-go-lucky people. Marla is about to head off to college, but she actually dreams of travelling the world, seeing the sights and filling up all the pages in her passport. Oh, wouldn't that just be a dream? You know, if only there was a simple way to explain that desire of wanting to get out there and do more with your life than simply going back into education. Easier than just saying that life's boring if you don't go anywhere and don't do anything. Gap year. This whole prologue scene is one crazy long explanation of Marla's dream to go on a gap year. 
though for the life of her she can't actually articulate those simple words and must explain it in a pretty poorly written dialogue exchange with Charlie. All of something to note, did you know the Playmobil movie is a musical? I didn't watch any of the trailers properly for the Playmobil movie and pretty much went in entirely blind, but it certainly wasn't what I was expecting when Marla leaps onto her bed and sings her heart out about the big old exciting adventure she wants to have over a simple boring educational life in a stagnantly moving existence. Now the film only feels more like something out of the Disney Channel. Also, why exactly is this movie a musical? Do you think the writers just saw that the Lego movie had that one song and figured that they should do the same but with more? If it is inspired by the Lego movie, then this is about as close to a translation error as you can get, because the Lego movie is not a musical. But hey, I guess Playmobil just wanted to really appeal to kids with that extra little kick. It's a shame that none of the songs have any real appeal to stick into people's minds and it's just a bit of exposition and easy jokes. Oh well. Anyway, we're now like five minutes into this film and we haven't seen anything Playmobil related just yet. But don't get too excited, because we next get a ham-fisted little play scene with Marla and Charlie playing with their Playmobil. You know, like every little family has been known to do. They show off their OC characters and finish their little quest with some super cool move that you can totally expect to show up at the end of the film to hit that acceptable writing quota or whatever. And then, like Disney clockwork, there's a knock at the door. It's the police. You can tell because the officers chose not to turn off their blinding lights even though they're just parked outside. They come with the news that Marla and Charlie's parents have been in a car accident and have since now died. Congratulations, you're real protagonists now! And then we cut to four years later. Man, there's a distinct lack of Playmobil going on right now. Four years, really? At this point, the most we get is the occasional Playmobil character settled in a drawer or something, and it doesn't really translate well. If they were somehow magical characters watching the events like Toy Story or something, then it would at least be a little bit more interesting, but instead it just feels like awful product placement to remind you that you did in fact spend way too much money to see this damn film. Anyway, now the kids are depressed. Marla's abandoned her dreams to look after Charlie, and their relationship is strained. Charlie storms into his room and we soon enough find out that he's run away. Panicked, Marla chases after him and traces his phone. Um, this doesn't really come up again. Like, there's a faint element of overprotective parenting and later Charlie does half complain about the tracker by asking how on earth she found him, but it never gets addressed again. So forget that little plot point. It's only there to move the story forwards anyway. Yeah, get used to that. So Charlie is heading over to a friend's place, judging by his phone call, but he gets distracted by a giant T-Rex model being carted into the back of an upcoming toy complex. And he follows in, cause why wouldn't he? Also that phone friend? Yeah, you can forget them too. By the end of the movie, their existence has vanished as well. Inside the complex, Charlie finds a massive Playmobil gallery, with a giant world all placed around the hall. Marla soon catches up and confronts Charlie, who is enamoured by the room, even going as far to say that the layout is exactly the same as the world they used to play in back in the day. What are the chances? He also whips out his OC Playmobil character, because of course he still has it on a keychain, even after four years have passed, and realises there's even a spot for his character. It's almost like fate has brought them here in this exact time and place. So yes, while the Lego movie mostly explores all about the magic of imagination, the Playmobil movie goes into real life magic. And honestly, I don't hate that too much. It's a nice divergence from the Lego movie that could go in some interesting directions. Why did fate bring them to this point? Is it all just to solve Marla's depressing growth from grief? Is it some kind of parent intervention from the afterlife? Are every Playmobil toy is enriched with magic? What controls the magic and what's its purpose? Don't think about it too hard, because that's not going to be answered either. Which I guess is fine. Sometimes that works. But for this film, it just feels like it's only there to move the plot forwards. Not even a hint is given, and it's basically forgotten by the end. Ugh. So Charlie places his character into its spot, and the Playmobil lighthouse captures both of them and spits them into the Playmobil world, probably a solid 20 minutes into the film. And finally, it can actually begin. All the baggage is out of the way. Marla plops in as herself, the quirky everywoman that has funny, funny things happen to her. And Charlie crashes in as his OC Viking Knight for some reason. I can't tell if it's because he brought his toy or because he still has his playful side, it's not really explained. So now comes the run-along theme of watching events pass by, never to be introduced again. 
Marla struggles to work out her new body, struggling to move her legs because they don't have knees, which I actually thought was slightly funny, but give it 30 seconds and she's running perfectly fine because she has to run away from the middle of the battle they've appeared in between. It's between the Vikings and the Scots. Marla hides in fear whilst Charlie joins the fight, discovering his new superhuman strength. With his help, the Vikings win and the Scots flee, never to be seen again. The Vikings hail Charlie as their strongest soldier and celebrate for him. Now it almost looks like there could be a rivalry brewing with the second strongest Viking being a leader who's overshadowed, but no. Instead, some evil pirate grunts are spying for the strongest Viking, they pick Charlie, and Charlie accidentally steps on a catapult, flinging him right to them. How awfully convenient to move the plot again. Marla, panicked and wanting to get back, chases Charlie on horseback. And those Vikings? Well, they don't chase Charlie. I figure they just sit at their benches and eat more chicken, because we're not going to be seeing them again, apart from a cameo at the end of the film. You'd have thought a Viking army would want to retrieve their strongest soldier and would come blazing through in the finale to rescue him. Or maybe even the Scots would charge in, calling for revenge or something like that. But no, they're just a stepping stone to be used and forgotten. Kind of like a Playmobil toy when you're waiting for your Lego set to be delivered. So anyway, Marla chases the captured Charlie who's been thrown into a cage into a vehicle and reaches a giant highway with all sorts of vehicles and mishmashed themes. I actually quite like this mashup as it felt like the worlds were all connected and random. But as for the sequence, Marla's chasing them up, hops between cars at one point, destroys the livelihood of a guy in a truck trying to sell enchanted hay to pay off a debt and loses sight of Charlie who seems to have vanished in thin air. Everyone's upset, especially Truck Guy, whose name is Dell, by the way, and Marla wanders off into the Western world to find someone who can help her. Oh hey, the second major location is a big old Western. This really did start off as a Lego movie fan fiction, didn't it? In the Western, the sheriff is busy and everyone else is unfriendly. Dell's there again, trying to sell hay, but it turns horses into Pegasuses with an acid problem. Hilarious. Dell's amused by Marna's plans and watches her attempt to gather a posse. She flaunts some gold coins Charlie won from the battle and suddenly everyone turns on her. Alright, there's not a lot of good jokes in this film. The wit of the Lego movie certainly hasn't translated too well here, but the best one is probably this one. And it got exposed in the trailer anyway. Everyone in the Western world gives off that standoffish stare, including the baby and the chicken. Every cowboy now wants to kill her for that money, so her and Dell escape by truck off into the sunset. Changing his mind, Dell agrees to help Marla, given that he gets the money to pay off his debt. Moving over to the slightly more interesting plot points, Charlie has been taken to Constantinopolis, a kind of modern day coliseum, now with giant spotlights and a big old sporty overhead banner. Again, I really enjoy the set designs of some of these places and concepts, but that's about as interesting as it gets. It genuinely makes me wonder how Colosseums would look these days if they were revived and upgraded with modern technology. But that's not important to the film. So what's going on is our main villain, Emperor Maximus, has captured the strongest of each archetype of character. I mean, he doesn't say it, but it's basically what he's done. He's got a pirate, an alien bounty hunter, a caveman, an Amazonian woman, a ninja, and a viking. I guess it's the closest the Playmobil could do to having all sorts of trademarked characters. Either way, don't get too attached to them. This film suffers from Sonic 06 syndrome where there's so many different branches to develop that none of them actually get developed. And they're just not going to do much all film. The ninja even dies immediately after being thrown into a Colosseum match by the big beast we're not allowed to see just yet. Maximus also has a whole song number about his plans and it's okay if not a little screechy, but again, it's just not memorable. It just exists. Back to Marla and to find more help they find Rex Dasher, a douchebag spy who you don't find, he finds you. And yeah, he just sort of shows up. I guess he's supposed to be a big parody of overpowered spies, but he very much overstays his welcome and you just sort of learn to kind of ignore him where you can. He's also got this annoyingly repetitive theme tune that's the closest thing to a real earworm you can get from this film. If you count just saying the words Rex Dasher a thousand times a real song. Anyway, next there's a whole sequence about sneaking through some evil headquarters to get CCTV footage of the vehicle disappearance and I actually like the joke that prefaces this sequence, showing how it's an undercover evil base disguised as a flower shop. You can't tell just by looking at it, but if you look up to the roof, you see a cluster of satellite dishes, clearly not fitting for a flower shop. There's also a joke about the acronym of Skull, the evil grunt guys, but it's not that great. Great enough to be put in the trailer though, apparently. 
This sequence is okay. Rex Dasher, being the master of disguise, has Marla pretend to be the big bad evil lady. She gets in and tells the Freeze Ray people to use more ice on the Freeze Ray when asked for advice. Hilarious. And eventually she gets her footage and escapes, one way or another. This whole organization never comes back. Big Evil Lady isn't relevant, the Freeze Ray is only used to escape again, and there's a throwaway mention joke of a death submarine thing, but that never pops up either. Again, it's just a location to move the plot forwards. Nothing witty, nothing smart. With it all being a big over-the-top parody, there could have been, like, I don't know, some other guy being captured or about to be tortured that Marla interrupts but doesn't save because she's busy on this current escapade or something. An extra little nod to make a parody out of the genre, and being a little bit witty and funny too, maybe. But whatever. They all escape by car and Rex Dasher leaves the group even though he easily could have stuck around and is captured by those pirate grunts. Again, just gotta move on with that plot. Meanwhile, Charlie and the gang escape their cell with their one-dimensional character traits of zapping guards, sniffing fish, and pointing at a ship. This is literally the only things most of these guys do. On board the ship, Charlie does the commanding, does it wrong, and they're all recaptured. And that's the whole progress of that sequence. Although not before Charlie celebrates with the very fresh joke of bloody flossing! <gasps> the floss dance was invented in August 2016! This bloody joke is literally three years old now! You literally cannot get more unoriginal and outdated than this! And in fact, this isn't even really a joke! Charlie just does it saying, oh, I bet my sister will be proud of me! That's not funny! That's so lazy and boring and idiotic! <sighs> the CCTV footage Marla obtained showed that the villain's vehicle did teleport, as anyone who actually watched the film could have told you 40 minutes ago. And Dell recognizes that it's the work of special tech through the power of zoom and enhance. <sighs> Turns out the same threat pushing Dell for money also sold that tech. So they confront her, and Dell intends to pay with all of Marla's money. But Marla lied about how much she has. Whoa! Glenara is the evil threat, by the way. She's a Jabba the Hutt ripoff, too. Or is this supposed to be some tasteful reference instead? I don't think the movie knows the difference. Anyway, that forced disagreement splits up the two of them because the plot demands it, and Glenara attempts to kill them with a teleporter into some deadly environment. But Marla's dashing looks and kind personality convinces Glenara's servant robot to save them because it's in love. Does it sound like I'm trailing off? Have I been trailing off for like the last five minutes? Because the movie very much feels like it's trailing off with another anyway this is happening now event again and again and again. They end up landing in an enchanted forest, Dell storms off and Marla wanders with the robot. The robot is also mostly unintelligible and doesn't do much either, it mostly just falls apart. Don't get too attached to this guy, even though he's like the third piece of the trio, I guess. Charlie and the gang are re-imprisoned, now outdoors, and Rex Dasher arrives to join them. Rex tells of Marla's adventures to save Charlie, inspiring him. Charlie's super strength breaks them free and they escape, with Charlie now hanging back against soldiers for no real reason. This plot sure needs a lot of help to keep going, doesn't it? Back to Marla and her walking places her right back where she started again. So she throws her passport in anger, which also appeared with her for some plot-related reason. She hits and beckons the fairy godmother, yet another plot device used to make the story continue, granting one wish, or at least a somewhat plausible one. She inspires Marla onwards, gets her out of the forest, gives her a pretty dress, cause that's what all the girls need to be happy and to sell merch to kids later on, pushes her to a nearby castle town, tells her that she's already set forward Dell, and gives her a secret gift to help her become who she used to be. This right here isn't just pushing the plot forwards, this is like some kind of roundhouse kick into the right direction. And it really feels wasted. The fairy godmother isn't gonna come back again in the film, and the castle in the distance just exists to be walked through, I guess? I thought this was leading into a trap with how the civilians called Marla Her Majesty, like it was leading to some sort of entrapment wedding that she didn't want, or a cage. But no, just a happy-go-lucky, keep-going sing-song. Like, it could have gone in an entirely different direction by getting some real character development going on where Marla maybe truly proves herself as being able to do things rather than just being given magic and going on with it. Like, there's a small moment of her fighting like a knight with a couple kids on the way in. 
What if it was here that she proved herself as an actual knight and grew herself some help in the form of a knight army to go crashing into Constantinopolis with? But no, she's just given the easy route with a stereotypical girly smile to go forth with. Also, it's at the top of this castle here that we learn that Constantinopolis is seriously nearby. Anglinara told them Charlie would be there. Oh, and Marla is given a flying carpet or banner to take her and the robot there. This isn't a roundhouse kick of a plot device anymore. It's more like being hit by a bloody bullet train into the right direction. Of course the place they teleported to is right next door to the Colosseum, and of course she has a flying carpet. There was a whole element of Constantinopolis being inaccessible due to being on a distant island surrounded by an impenetrable wall, which I perceived as meaning it was in another room to the Playmobil room, but no, it was just over a footpath, across a single body of ignorable water. Wow, everything sure got solved real quick. It's like the film was running out of time after exhausting so much of its resources on a slow live action opening. Charlie is being held and prepped for the Colosseum match against the giant beast. Soldiers sprinkle herbs and peppers on Charlie to make him tastier. Hilarious. Remember, he's only in this predicament because he decided to stop escaping. Marla's robot partner's one other deed in the film comes in here as he helps Marla climb a tall wall in Constantinopolis. So wouldn't the flying carpet be able to place her on top of that wall or even just directly into the Colosseum itself? Yeah, whatever. Marla sneaks in, taking a disguise and using the occasional spy gear because she's always had that, I guess. The robot is left behind because apparently he looks too conspicuous. Finally, she reaches the Colosseum where Charlie is being thrown into battle against a giant T-Rex, just like the one in, in real life. life. Wow. Mana at some point put on her secret gift from the fairy godmother, a full suit of golden armor. It's Mana's ancient Playmobil OC from four years ago, literally who she was four years ago. Wow. The two avoid the T-Rex as best they can, but do very little to hurt it. And soon enough, in swoops Del and the robot, both in truck. We quickly hear in the background that with Del's wish, he was able to pay off Glinara and fix all his problems off screen. Great storytelling there. And I guess he also managed to get his truck back and find the robot who was just standing in the middle of the Constantinopolis marketplace. Anyway, in the truck is Dell's enchanted hay, and using the super duo cool move the two used back when they were playing with toys in the real world, Marla and Charlie manage to feed it to the T-Rex. The T-Rex becomes docile and flies about, angering Maximus who calls for the guards, and in come several guards. But instead, it's Charlie's gang who appear in the Colosseum to just stand around and celebrate, really. The final member, the pirate, captures Maximus and cages him. With Maximus's guards either running away or siding back with the pirate captain, I guess. I mean, what a boring and anticlimactic ending. The T-Rex isn't defeated, just subdued. Maximus isn't killed, he isn't pushed into the Colosseum, and he isn't eaten by his own giant beast. He just gets put in a cage. And there's no real twist here either. With the skull grunts all being pirates, I was half expecting the pirate member to be the true villain of the film. But instead, the grunts were just going against the main pirate, but returned to him afterwards, apart from two who chose to die by piranhas instead. There could have been so many more directions for this ending to see. What if the Vikings came pouring back into the Colosseum? What if the Scots showed up? What if Marla invaded with a knight army, or Maximus was given any real punishment? Imagine being able to see a real fight with all the good guys using their abilities against hordes of guards. Anything to give plenty of characters their proper screen time moment. There's a whole giant Colosseum arena for some big action sequence, but all that happens is a T-Rex steps around for a while, eats some hay, and starts flying instead. Absolutely nothing satisfying at all is to be had here. Everyone then also just stands around happy for a really extended amount of time. Dell is joyous over people wanting to eat food from his food truck. That's a that's a great joke! I'm, I'm glad they kept that one in the script. And eventually, Marla and Charlie ride the Pegasus T-Rex all the way back to the lighthouse. We see several areas beneath them, which I guess is okay. It's a cameo opportunity for those Vikings the film had long forgotten, I guess. Though the Pegasus horses from the Western world, surprisingly, also don't join the T-Rex like you would have thought they would. And Marla and Charlie reappear back in the real world, having only passed five minutes of real time, apparently. The Playmobil set around them has moved, and Marla's passport is now filled with location marks. Wow, that's magical! 
They leave satisfied and happy as a functional family again. Forget the phone tracker or Charlie's phone friend or the whole magical fate element at all, it's bedtime. And it all ends with Maximus escaping entrapment thanks to the IRL guard moving him from the floor, which wasn't where he was in the Playmobil world anyway. And with all that, cue the credits. Yikes, I don't see a sequel coming out anytime soon, not with those scores. This film very much plays out like the career of the Playmobil toys. It flops in comparison to Lego and will always be cast away in its shadow. It was doomed from the very start of its inception, but even then, the directions it chose to take were all wrong. Losing out on the witty humour, the ability to keep any kind of good pace on the film, and just filling the time slot with cheap, poor quality jokes and plot devices to string together something that resembles a plot. The animation is nothing special stylistically, and just looks like another generic animated action film, with all of the action muted away and avoided by the end of it. I'd be lying if I said that this film really had some potential, but almost every direction it took was lackluster or wrong. The use of magic and fate could have been interesting, the set designs could have been more creative than just archetypes, though Playmobil kinda cornered themselves there on that front considering all their toys are bland and basic, and the plot could have been more interesting if it explored something else entirely. What if the Vikings were the bad guys and it was wrong to side with them first? Why does Dell have a debt? Uh, actually, I don't really care about that one. What if the castle town was a trap or a chance to grow a knight army? What if the whole fate thing linked into the Playmobil world like a prophecy of a golden knight to appear and take the title one day, like the castle town was Camelot and Marla was a mistranslation of King Arthur? Or what if there is a big bombastic battle with all of the hordes of characters somewhat developed or at least appearing in the film? Imagine if characters were given more development like every member of Charlie's gang or the robot servant. And my god, just stop on all the ham-fisted plot devices and pushing moments. What if Dell's truck was later able to be upgraded with the teleportation tech in order to get to Constantinopolis after discovering the source and outwitting Glenara or something? A cool techie sense of progress and a nice cyclical plot. Way better than just a fairy tale godmother showing up and fixing the world's problems. But ultimately, the Playmobil movie was just not that kind of film. And just from glancing in its general direction, you can tell that from the very start. Really, this was just one big cash grab trying to hit the magic of the Lego movie without any real talent or understanding of what actually made it so good. This was a ham-fisted, unoriginal and incredibly disappointing example of a modern day movie title, and I'm glad to be seeing the backside of it. This was fun, don't come back, Playmobil. And as for you American viewers, do look forward to having this undercooked mistake hitting your big screens ready for Christmas this December. Or just come back to this video to learn all there is to know. Maybe I'll hit that super rare double wave of YouTube views. Uh, it was worth a try. Later!